Good morning friends, we will continue with our earlier discussions on linearity of systems. As you had mentioned, a linear system will have the property like this, mathematically we can write the property like this. If we excite a system by an input x1 t, it can be either a voltage or a current and the corresponding output is y1 t. Similarly, if we excite it by an input x2 t and the corresponding output is y2 t, then any combination of x1 and x2, say a1 x1 plus a2 x2 t will result into a 1 y 1 t plus a 2 y 2 t if the system is linear. This is the principle of superposition. Now, sometimes you are given the system equation in the form of differential equations. How do you determine whether a differential equation is a linear differential equation or not. Suppose you are given, I will give you a simple example, say d square x by d t squared plus 2 into d x by d t minus 3 into x is equal to some forcing function f 1 t may be sin t, sin 4 t. Another equation d square x by d t squared whole squared plus 2 into d x by d t minus 3 x is equal to sin 4 t. The third equation is d x by d t sorry d square x by d t into t plus 2 into d x by d t minus 3 x is equal to sin 4 t. d square x by d t square plus 2 into x into d x by d t minus 3 x is equal to 4 t. Now, out of these which one will be linear, which one will be nonlinear, which one will be representing a nonlinear system? Yes, first one let us examine one by one. First one is it a linear differential equation? Linear differential equation? the right hand side is sin 4 t. Is it a linear equation? Is it a linear function? No. This is a forcing function. What about this side? They are all linear elements? They are. So, is it a linear differential equation? It is. The forcing function whether it is sin 4 t, log t, root t does not determine the behavior of the system forcing function is external to the system. It is this input is external to the system. So, the right hand side the forcing function here can be anything. Now, this side all these elements are linear. When we say linear that means the variable the dependent variable x or its derivatives they all appear in a linear form. Okay. Here d square x by d t square is squared, so it is in a nonlinear form. Similarly, in this equation the fourth one it is 2 x into d x by d t. So, d x by d t gets multiplied by x all right. whether it is x into d x by d t or x squared or d square x by d t whole squared okay. like the second equation these are all nonlinear equation, nonlinear form of x and its derivative. What about this one the third equation? 
here it is multiplied by the independent variable. So, it is a linear time varying system, it is linear time varying system, but it is not non-linear. Okay. So, you must be in a position to identify a linear system from a non-linear system, this is also a linear system, but it is having a time varying coefficient. A very nice example of a linear time varying system will be say a furnace, a furnace you have the brick lining okay. if you start an experiment now with so much of input of fuel say so much of charge kept in this identical charge. If you perform the experiment say today and tomorrow there is not much of a change in the furnace behavior, furnace characteristics. So, if you want to write say the heat flow equation, you will find the equations are identical, but after 8 or 10 months say over the use of the furnace, the brick lining, the fire brick lining will gradually get damaged or right, they will be aging. So, the thermal property of the brick lining will be changing, periodically you have to uh, go for maintenance, you have to change the brick lining and after 10 months or so if you perform the same experiment you will find the heat flow equations will be different because the resistance, the thermal resistance has changed over time. So, it is an example of time varying coefficients. The system differential equations may be identical, but with time varying coefficients. So, <coughs> sorry, whenever the elements like R, L, C, etc., are suffering a time varying change like aging, you have time varying differential equations of this type. Even though the system is linear, it is not nonlinear, but there can be coefficients which may change. Now, a resistor, pure resistance, it is linear time invariant system, it is an oversimplification. All right. People had conducted some simple experiments over a certain range of temperature, the resistance virtually remains constant. So, we simplify the model by a simple linear relationship V is equal to R into I, but actual resistance may be varying in a nonlinear fashion. Right. As the current increases, the resistance may also change. There are many nonlinear resistances in uh, day to day use. For example, a bulb, the filament of a bulb, if you change the voltage, the current also changes. If you take the voltage by current ratio, it is not fixed, it changes. For example, for a resistance. The characteristics, the ideal linear resistance, say this is a low value of resistance, if the characteristic is like this, this is a high value of resistance and you may have sometimes, okay, I draw on this side. If you have performed any experiment on the bulb, filament bulb incandescent bulbs, depending on the type of filament, it can have a characteristic like this or this. Here the resistance, sorry, this is the voltage, say. the slope rep represents the resistance value. So, resistance keeps on falling in this case, okay. voltage by current ratio does not remain same. In the other case, it may increase. Okay. So, this is the example of a nonlinear resistor. Best example is incandescent lamp. So, we approximate them to be linear for small values of current or we linearize around an operating point. Say if this is an operating point, so around this point it is the slope is taken as the resistance. 
or we define as incremental resistance. Suppose this is V plus delta V, this is V and this is I, this is I naught plus delta I, this is say V naught and I V naught and I naught, V naught plus delta V, I naught plus delta I. So, the slope approximately is delta V by delta I at the working value V naught I naught. So, this is dv by di. So, the resistance incremental resistance is basically the slope of this v i characteristics at an operating point. Similarly, for an inductance, how do you define an inductance by the way? How do you define an inductance? Inductance is it can be defined in two ways time derivative of current and the corresponding voltage induced. Uh, a question that I very often ask and I would ask you also, does a straight conductor carrying a DC have an inductance? Does a coil carrying a DC have an inductance? Does a straight conductor carrying an AC have an inductance? Yes, can you tell me? A straight conductor carrying a DC, will it have an inductance? The first thing that comes to your mind, inductance means L di by dt will be the voltage. You are used to think like that. So, the voltage, since it is carrying DC, so the voltage induced will be 0 because there is no change in current. So, I give an example you have a mass you apply a force, there is an acceleration. So, what is the mass? Yes, mass is force by acceleration. Now, you do not apply a force, so there is no acceleration. Does it mean the mass is not there? Mass is there, it is irrespective of the force applied. So, inductance is the property by which the conductor tries to establish the flux lines whenever there is a current flowing through it. So, whenever you have a current, there will be a flux established by the very property of inductance. So, it is a flux linkage, flux number of flux lines if you can count them from the conductor body to infinity. So, number of flux lines divided by the current will be the inductance. Now, obviously, it is not so easily measurable, I mean it is difficult to measure this. But if by some means you can measure the flux lines established, then that will be giving you the inductance. So, it is immaterial whether you are passing a DC or an AC. Only advantage is for AC is this that whenever there is an AC, you get a voltage induced which will be proportional to L di by dt and you can compute the inductance. So, it is only for our computational convenience that we try to measure the inductance with the help of AC, but when there is a DC inductance is there because flux lines are established. So, any straight conductor because current is always associated with the magnetic field. So, any straight conductor the moment you pass a current will always have flux linkage and hence there will be an inductance however small it may be. So, for all practical purposes a straight conductor does not have a perceptible inductance especially when we deal with very low frequencies. When you go to very, very high induct, uh, very, very high frequency, then the inductance will give rise to quite a substantial voltage drop if you pass a current of a very high uh, frequency. So, an inductance will be present whether it is a straight conductor or a coil, whether it is carrying AC or DC. Okay. For example, when you go to the market to
to buy uh, an inductance. You do not say I will be using it for AC, please give me an inductance to be used for an AC. You do not specify this is 2 milli Henry, 3 milli Henry, you specify only the value in Henry. I want uh, uh, so much current rating and so much inductance value a coil. So, an inductance will be given by this ratio if it is a linear one. It is flux or linkage per unit ampere. Now, it is not necessary, it is not necessary that it will be always a characteristic like this. There can be inductances where the variation of the flux linkage may be like this. Can you cite an example? This is a nonlinear characteristics. That means, once again, here also the flux linkage per unit ampere keeps on changing with the value of i, with the value of i. So, can you cite an example? For example, the flux linkage in a coil where you have a ferromagnetic core which gets saturated after some time, okay. you do not get an additional flux per unit change of current at the same rate after some time. Okay. So, here the inductance value keeps on changing once again the slope as you have seen earlier d v by d i. So, it will be incremental inductance which will be d psi by d i. Okay. So, flux linkage and the current instead of pure ratio you have to have the derivative d psi by d i. Okay. So, that will be the incremental value of the inductance that is at any operating point what is the slope. Capacitances normally are linear, normally capacitances are linear. Uh, there can be imperfect capacitances, then of course, at different frequencies you will have, you have to have a proper representation of the uh, leaking resistance, otherwise a capacitive element is linear. There can be different types of nonlinearities that may be present in a physical system. So, before we go to networks in general, we will be discussing about uh, mathematical as well as physical nonlinearities that are present in most of the physical systems. One of the most common type of nonlinearity is relay type. A relay type of nonlinearity. A relay type means where the input and the output variables are related like this. That is y or f x if I write f x as the output is equal to f naught this is f naught and this is minus f naught if x is greater than 0 and is equal to minus f naught if x is less than 0. This is relay type. There is another nonlinearity it is relay with dead band, relay with dead band that is there is a dead band after which only the system responds. So, you have x naught and minus x naught as threshold. So, below this threshold value of x, there is no response, it is 0. So, f x 
will be equal to 0 okay, if x is between x naught and minus x naught is equal to f naught, this is again f naught. this is <coughs> minus f naught. When x is greater than x naught equal to minus f naught when x is less than x naught. Okay. So, this is relay with dead band. Then you have fixed dead band only. Fixed dead band only. Here beyond this point x naught the relay output is proportional to the input. The effective input is this much x minus x naught. So, this is giving you the output accordingly. So, this is f x. Similarly, on this side. So, f x equal to some k times x minus x naught when x is greater than x naught equal to minus k times x minus x naught. Correct me if I am wrong. If it is x minus x naught, will that be all right? It should be x plus x naught. It is minus x naught, mind you. Slope is positive. Slope is negative or slope positive. Positive. It should be positive. Sir. Slope should be positive. Yeah, okay. Positive. Then x minus x naught is all right. Hmm. Is that all right? When x is, then there is no difference. Then there is no difference. The difference in the values are the x. X naught was there. Now it is minus x naught. So I should replace it by plus. No. Is it all right? So when x naught is in this position, there will be an output. Okay. Next, you have fixed dead band, this one, and then you can have dead band. Okay, uh, we will take that later on. Let us see hysteresis. Hysteresis type of nonlinearity and ideal hysteresis. is like this. So, his is his type of nonlinearity is like this. Say this is x1 minus x1 and this is fx. So, fx I will write on this side fx equal to f naught, this is f naught. If x is greater than x naught and 
x is going this way ok x is greater than x 1 x is greater than x 1 ok because we are using x naught earlier now we are writing x 1 if x is greater than x 1 and x is increasing I will show this way this is the direction for x positive and then equal to f naught if x is lying between minus x 1 and plus x 1 ok. Is that all right? And x is moving in this direction. Why is this direction so important? It is obvious at this value of x, it is double valued. It can have either this value or this value. When is it having this value? When x is receding, x is going this way. All right. And when will it be in this position? When x will be increasing. So, the direction, it is a direction sensitive value it is a double valued function it can take either this value or that value. So, that will be specified by the direction of variation of x ok. So, similarly equal to minus f naught minus f naught if x is less than minus x 1 and x is going in this direction equal to minus f naught if minus x 1 x x 1 when it is in this range, but x is increasing and x is going in this direction all right. So, these are some of the types of nonlinearities that we have discussed. You can also define another nonlinearity hysteresis with dead band hysteresis with dead band. So, I show you only the nature of variation and leave it to you as an exercise to define the function mathematically. So, it follows a path like this uh, as x varies as x varies it takes this path and then it gets saturated at f naught. When you are retracing back when you are reducing x it follows this path and then it should have been hmm, yes along this. So, if I mark it as x 1 and x 2 if they are identical then this will be minus x 1 and minus x 2 these are the threshold values. Okay. So, when again you are increasing x it remains at f naught minus f naught then follows this path then from here it goes to x 2. So, from minus x 1 to x 2 it remains 0. In the return path from plus x 1 to minus x 2 it remains 0. Okay. So, you please try to define f x in terms of different ranges ok. Then there can be another type of nonlinearity diode type where you define the diode characteristics like this. <coughs> Uh, 
this side the breakdown is at a very high value whereas here it starts conducting. So, this is a dot type of nonlinearity it is not to the scale as such and then you have saturation type of nonlinearity like this they may be symmetrical in all these nonlinear functions that we have discussed it is not necessary it is not necessary for a physical system to have a symmetry in the nonlinearity sometimes this side x naught this side it can be x naught dashed it, it can be something else so there can be asymmetry in there uh, properties in their characteristics. Next we come to dot convention of coupled coils. What should be the dot convention for coupled coils? two coils are coupled let us assume a ferromagnetic core is used and two coils are wound over it to simplify the matter let us see two coils in the same sense we have got two coils like this having number of turns n 1 and n 2. Okay. There is a resistance connected here R 1 resistance R 2 and there is a current I 1 and I 2. The terminals are noted we mark them as 1 1 dashed and 2 2 dashed. Okay. Now, suppose from a source V G we try to send a current I 1 through this coil n 1 it should have been like this anyway I was thinking of putting another turn anyway. Uh, so, current is going like this and suppose that establishes a flux phi to 1 in this direction at some point of time. Then what should be the positive sense of the current? if I short this if I short this if there is a current that is establishing a flux phi to 1 which is established by I 1 then this will try to this coil if it is shorted it will try to send a current in such a way as to oppose this flux is it not that is by Lenz's law. So, any shorted coil will try to circulate a current so, as to oppose the very establishment of the flux that is to oppose the cause. Therefore, I will term this as a positive current when this is positive in coil 1. Okay. So, if coil 1 this terminal is noted with a dot that means current is entering from this terminal 1 leaving through 1 dashed leaving through 1 dashed then in the secondary coil 
current is flowing from 2 and going to the external circuit from 2 to 2 dashed. Is that clear? That means, when a coil is shown 1, 1 dashed and I put a dot here, that means, if I excite this coil, if I excite this coil, 1 will be trying to send a flux phi to 1 and correspondingly a shorted coil will try to send a current from 2 to 2 dashed, if this is also shown by a dot. Okay. Alternatively, if I excite this coil by sending a current from here and if I remove this source, if I short circuit, if I short circuit this coil externally, then a current through this will try to force in an induced current which will be going from 1 to 1 dash in the external circuit. If I inject a current from 2 inside the coil 2 to 2 dash, then current from 1 will go to 1 dash through the external circuit if this is shorted. Okay. So, this is the convention that we follow for the coils. Now, I pose a few questions before you and see what would be uh, what would be the nature of variation of different quantities. Suppose, I have R 1 and R 2 some fixed resistances, what would be the variation of the currents, flux, voltages induced and so on. We have applied uh, V g okay, at time t, we have just switched it on at time t equal to t 0. So, it is a step input of voltage that means, we are giving a DC supply here, we are just switching on the supply DC supply across this coil, it is having some finite resistance. Okay. What will be the nature of variation of the current I 1, I 1 will be how much? Suppose, this is kept open, this coil is not there, then at t equal to 0, it will go on like this, just like an any inductor R L circuit. Okay. This you have studied in first year class, principles of electrical engineering, you have studied simple R L and R C transients. So, it is behaving like this. What will be the nature of variation of the flux phi to 1? It is also identical, it is proportional to the current I 1, it will be like this. What will be the open circuit voltage? If I keep it open, what will be the open circuit voltage? Voltage across this secondary coil? Voltage across this coil, what will be its nature? N 1 by N 2 etcetera, I understand that will be only giving you a ratio, but what about the voltage? How will it change? this is T 0. So, before T 0 nothing happens, after that as soon as you switch it on the current keeps on increasing. So, flux is also increasing like this. So, what is the voltage induced? It will be N 2 times d phi to 1 by d t. So, it will be depending on the slope, is it not? So, how is the slope changing? Initially the slope is this much and gradually it is becoming 0. 
So, if you apply DC, DC supply onto a transformer primary and you measure the secondary voltage, finally it will come down to 0. zero. It will start with the maximum value and then it will gradually come down to 0 because the slope here will be 0. Is that all right? So, this is V 2 with respect to time. Now, I pose a few questions. If R 1 is 0, sketch the three quantities I 1, phi 2 1, V 2 and also I 2 if I short it. So, R 1 is 0 and R 2 is 0. That is, you have to compute or you have to sketch I 1, phi 2 1, V 2 and I 2. Next case, when R 1 is 0, but R 2 is not equal to 0, R 2 is finite. And thirdly, when R 1 is not equal to 0, but R 2 is 0, okay. another set of interesting questions I want to pose before you is what if the current I 2 would flow in the opposite direction? If the current flows in the opposite direction, what happens? Why can it not flow in the opposite direction? Next, what would be the value of I 2 in case I 1 is a DC that is a steady value? If I 1 is a steady value, what will be I 2? And so, the questions are if current I 2 flows in the opposite direction, can it ever flow in the opposite direction? Next, if I 1 is a steady DC, steady current that is DC, what will be I 2? And what would be the flux phi to 1? when R 2 is 0 and R 2 is infinity and R 1 is not equal to 0. What would be phi to 1 if R 1 is not equal to 0 and R 2 equal to 0 and next infinity. Infinity means open circuited. What would be the values? Okay. One or two we will discuss here because they are very relevant. Sometimes by mistake you may put a DC supply onto a transformer, all right. Transformer is open circuited. Suppose the transformer is open circuited. So, what happens to the transformer? Or the transformer you are applying, say you are going for a short circuit test, transformer secondary terminals have been shorted and you are supposed to apply a very small AC voltage on the primary, instead of that you apply a DC, what happens? So, this is a situation when say when this side 
the secondary side is open. If you apply a DC, it is a simple RL circuit. So, after some time the current will be coming to a steady value like this. So, this current is decided totally by the resistance and the voltage supplied. So, voltage by resistance will be the current. If you apply a very large amount of a large value of voltage say 220 volts DC and the current resistance value is small then it will be uh, damaging the winding it will burn out. So, the voltage applied decides the level of uh, the level of the danger that is uh, the chances of uh, the winding getting damaged will be very much controlled only by the resistance value which is normally very low. And what happens to the flux? Flux also goes on increasing like this. So, just now we have studied, we have discussed the voltage on the secondary side will be varying like this. Now, suppose this is shorted, the resistance is not there or even if there is a resistance. If there is a resistance here, that will circulate a current that will try to circulate a current and that current will be trying to oppose the very cause. So, it will try to oppose the establishing <coughs> establishment of the flux sorry. So, what happens to the primary? What happens to this side current I 1? Will it be more or less? will it be more or less. If I short it through a resistance, why? A phi 2 1 it will try to re establish this flux, why? Why should it be re established? It will I 2 will try to oppose the flux, hmm. it will try to oppose the flux. So, will that modify this characteristics like this? This is what you anticipate, that means it will be going like this. Is it all right? You think of the situation in a transformer equivalent circuit if you have studied already. The equivalent circuit that is on the load side now you are having resistance R 2, earlier it was kept open, now you are putting a resistance R 2. That means, in the equivalent circuit you are trying to provide a path, alternative path through that secondary coil. So, the total current increases, earlier it was only the magnetizing current, now you are offering another path. So, the total current will increase. Okay. So, the current I 2, I 1 will be having a higher slope like this. So, it will be reaching that value very fast. Okay. If you have a resistance here, instead of shorting it directly, if you have a resistance here, Uh, of considerable value. So, so, it will be somewhere in between. If R 1 is 0 and R 2 is 0, if R 1 is 0 and R 2 is 0, what happens? That is across an inductance, across an inductance, if I switch on a supply, I say DC voltage if I apply across an inductance, pure inductance, there is no resistance, what happens to the current? It is L d i by d t which is constant V. So, if it is L d i by d t, L d i by d t which is constant that means, I will be constantly increasing, it is integral V d t, okay, it is proportional to integral V d t. So, I will be constantly increasing that means, you will get a current that will be continuously increasing and that will cause a secondary current also in the reverse direction, 
that will also be con constantly increasing. So, both primary and secondary currents will be increasing continuously. Okay. So, this is uh, uh, this is a very interesting situation. For example, sometimes when you apply uh, a sudden change in the voltage, say an impulse uh, pulse voltage in a pulse transformer, you get sudden changes and then though the voltage is there, there is no change, all right, there is no change. So, on the secondary side there is no output, whenever there is a change there is an output on the secondary side. So, this principle is used in a pulse transformer. Okay, thank you very much, we will continue with this in the next class. Good morning friends, yesterday we discussed about different connections of voltage and current sources and then we discussed something about nonlinearities, different types of nonlinearities, then dot convention and we will continue with that. Uh, the dot conventions that we adopted yesterday, I will just uh, repeat. If you have a core like this, if you are having a coil, say coil A or coil 1 1 dashed and another coil having the terminals 2 2 dashed, you see the coils are wound in the same sense, the coils are wound in the same sense then if the current if I call 1 as the starting terminal, 1 dashed as the finishing terminal, similarly 2 as the starting terminal, 2 dashed as the finishing terminal, if current through terminal 1 enters into the coil okay, like this and current through 2 also enters through this coil then both of them give rise to a flux in the same direction, all right. Or in other words, if we connect this with the source and if we short circuit this one externally, the current here will be flowing out of this terminal and entering through 2 dashed, all right. Because it will be having by transformer action, okay, if you are having an alternating voltage say applied here then the current here will be going in this direction. Okay. That means what? It means that if the coils, if the coils produce identical fluxes when they are excited separately, then those terminals, the starting terminals will be shown by dots. That means an, a current entering here corresponds to current entering here from an external source, they are identical that means they give rise to the flux in the same direction. This is easy to remember, all right. Now I give you an uh, example, uh, you try to find out whether this is this particular coil, uh, just one minute, this particular coil arrangement and the dot conventions are correct. You are having a toroid with a central limb. Okay. Now, you are having a volt supply voltage here and measure the current I 1 after shorting this. So, how much is it? It is the admittance seen from 1 1 dashed under this condition. So, it is two parallel elements Ya and Yc, okay. is it not? Za and Zc are in parallel. So, you add their admittances Ya plus Yc, very good. 
Similarly, y22 will be yb plus yc when I am shorting this side. What about y12? What about y12? How do you measure y12? y12 is i1 by v2 when v1 is 0. So, I short circuit this and then measure the current here when I am applying a voltage v2. So, y12 is i1 by v2, i1 by v2 when v1 is equal to 0 and how much is that? By convention i1 is positive when it is flowing in this direction. Now, when I am shorting this and applying a voltage here, there will be a current that will be flowing like this. This current does not affect this, does it? This current is independent of this side. I am measuring only this current and since this is short, so this is redundant. There is no current flowing to this all the currents will be flowing through this. So, the current flowing through this side will be through y c and then through this 0 at uh, 0 impedance. So, how much is the total admittance y c only y c what about sin because the current is flowing in the opposite direction. So, it will be minus y c ok. Now, if you are given these y parameters, there is a black box given to you. I have given you two ports, four terminals and I ask you to perform this short circuit test. That is you short circuit one side, two to dash, make a measurement from this side, make the measurement of the current on the other side, voltage from this side, voltage and current at this end and so on. That is you measure V v1 i1 i2 again excite the other side short circuit this side 1 1 dash apply a voltage v2 v2 i2 and i1 ok. So, you will get all the four quantities this is also i2 by v1 by the same logic when v2 is 0 when I short circuiting this applying a voltage and measuring this current is it alright. If you are given these parameters, but inside I do not know what it is, there can be number of elements interconnected, okay. 